We're looking down from the top of the tree. There's the apex. There's the trunk. You want your first branch, let's say you got in a rectangle or an oval pot. It doesn't matter which. Imagine that oval's in a rectangle, whatever, all right? Imagine there's artificial corners there. Your first branch is going to come out here somewhere to this tr corner or the other corner. Your second branch should come out here. Between those two, somewhere you should have a back branch. Now you're going to have your third branch. Your third branch maybe is going to come out over here. And you're going to have a fourth branch here. You're going to have a fifth branch here and a back branch and a sixth branch and a back branch and a seventh branch and an eighth branch and a ninth branch with a back branch mixed in and another back branch. You get the top third of the tree. Notice, no front branch until you get to the top third of the tree because you don't want to hide that beautiful trunk. You want to show off the structure of this tree. Remember, you, in old trees, it, when you see them from a distance, you see that structure. You see the trunk line. You see those branches, okay? See, we have to make that even more evident in a small scale because the viewers where? The viewers up close, okay? So it has to be more perfect even than in nature, all right? Because the viewers right here. So you really need to be able to see that structure so it looks like a tree. All right, so we don't put a front branch until we get up here in the top third of the tree. But notice all these branches form what? They form like spokes of a wheel. There's a lot of reasons for that. A couple reasons, good reasons. One, your tree will be healthier. Every branch will be able to get light. And these branches are all important. Next reason is that your tree will be aesthetically more pleasing to the eye. The shape of it will be better. All right. Notice where we put the branches. See, you never finish with your bonsai. You always keep working them, you know? It's like they're living things, you know? So you're always working them more and more and more. All right. That's the way you are. You, know, you start working your trees, you never want to stop. All right, we got a trunk line here. I'm going to do another one. Same trunk line. Notice where the branches are. See that one? All right, see that one? Which one flows better? That one. This one? Yeah. Or this one? No. Yeah. It's an optical illusion, but it's true, and it does flow better. We always put the branches, try to put the branches on the outside of the curves. One, the tree, the movement of the tree is better. Because this creates a stopping point. You want to stop at every one of these. Because it creates more of an intersection. Intersections are bad. Anything that creates a focal point on your tree is bad. You want to show off the tree, not that focal point. Beginners always come in here and say, oh, look at this neat branch on this tree. That's why I picked it. Or look at this neat root. That's why I picked it. That's usually the first thing I want to cut off. All right? If it's drawing your eye that much, there's something wrong with it. So we always try and put our branches on the outside of the curves. There's a few reasons for this. One of the reasons is that the flow is better. Another reason is that by being on the outside of the curve, it gets light better. It's not going to be under anything that's going to shade it. And another even more important reason. Wait, let's leave that. The other important reason is because this will really mess up our taper. Because branches on trees just don't grow off like that. Notice how they swell there? They're always fatter on the inside. They want to do that anyways. So I don't know why I should have to tell you to try and make them fatter and thinner on the outside. They want to do that anyways. But you do have to give it a little bit of, of, of pay, uh, follow through because some trees don't do it as well as others. Elms will tend to grow all out in one width if you let them. But they'll always swell right here at the base a little bit. All right? And if they swell on the outside of the curve, it enhances the curve. Big deal. 
So it enhanced the curve for us. But if it swells on the inside of the curve, it starts taking the motion away. It starts straightening your tree out, actually. You can really can. You can take a curved tree and make it straight by growing branches on the inside of the curves. Okay? Now this creates another issue. Since branches swell on the, at the base like that. This is a big problem with ficus. Are you listening, Andy? Yeah. Okay. Big problem with ficus. Got a ficus tree growing here. Kind of a young tree. Got a branch here. Got a branch here. Got a branch here, branch here, branch here. We got another branch growing right here. Well, first of all, you can see that the kite's kind of drawn there anyways, okay? So we don't like to have what we call handlebars. But another reason we don't want to have handlebars is if it's swelling there at the base, if both these are swelling, they will keep growing and growing and growing until you get what we call reverse taper and you end up with this big ball here, all right, that you will never be able to get rid of, destroys your tree, all right, and your eye is always drawn to it. So, that's a big problem with ficus because ficus like to grow with a lot of branches coming out at the same place. You always have to stay on top of them to keep them narrowed down. So you only got one to a side, all right? A lot of trees, in fact, all trees will do that to some degree, but ficus are really bad about it. Some other things we want to watch out for. Let's do this. Street tree. Tree from the hood, right? All right. So we got our street tree here. Pretty good flow. Your kite kind of moves up and down there pretty well. What happens if we didn't have that branch right there? Where's your eye go? Boom! Let's put it back. That's a little annoying. What happens Where'd your eye go? Boom! And you start getting that reverse taper then it'll really start going there. What happens? Bam, your eye's gone there too. Really try to avoid um, intersections on your trees. Anything that grows back towards the trunk, any kind of intersection whatsoever. Any open space that's not, uh, that doesn't flow with the rest of the tree, avoid. All right, because your eye's always gonna be drawn there. Okay. Let's see if we can do something else here. was what I was going to show you here. But you see that if you have good alternating branches, your, your eye moves along the tree pretty well. Something else I wanted to show you, and I don't remember what it was now.
Questions? That was the Reader's Digest version. Back when you uh, drew the tree looking down on it from above. Yeah. I don't know if it was just the way it was drawn or what. You had the limbs more concentrated sort of in the back. Uh, the it shouldn't have been. They actually should have been more to the front. To the front. Okay. Right. You don't want your back branches too long because it pulls your eye through the tree and you start looking behind the tree. You want your eye to be focused right on the tree. Back branches don't, shouldn't be that, that, um, that large. The other thing, let me give you an example. These are all guidelines, they're not hard and fast rules. Will you ever have a tree that's got a branch on the inside of a curve? Damn right, you know you're going to. I mean, it's just gonna happen. You know, you're gonna have one that you can't get rid of. Does that mean the tree's hopeless? No. All right. Um, got your rectangle, which is your most common. That's why we use an oval pot. All right. Imagine the center line. All right. Your tree should never be planted right there. Okay. Your tree is going to be behind center line and it's going to be off to one side. One of those places. Okay? And that's going to depend on the movement of the tree to decide which side it should be planted on. Alright? If you had a tree that was shaped somewhat like this, I would plant it on the right side because the movement's coming back this way. Okay. A lot of people say, oh, your first branch should always be the side that's away from the, the center. I mean, it goes towards the center. That's not necessarily true. You've got to look at the overall movement of the tree. It's, it differs with, with different trees, okay? Most important shape in bonsai. Oh, you didn't know there was the most important shape, did you? No, because I hadn't gotten there yet. There is a most important shape. Manuel, you've been reading a lot of books. You know what the most important shape in bonsai is? Yeah. What do you mean with shape? Shape. What's the most important shape in bonsai? I, I don't know what the whole one. Then All right. Yeah, Is it okay. this? I'm not getting hard here. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Maybe this. Oh, a triangle. Yes. Right. Everything about your tree is going to form a triangle. Not just any old triangle. No. Cannot. Just not any old triangle. Didn't know you were coming to geometry class, did you? All right. No, 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 no. Move on quickly. Eh, let's make you a little bit longer here. We have three types of triangles here. I'm going to make this one a little more pronounced so you can see it better. That's a little better. All right. This question is for Sharon, of course. <laughs> what kind of triangle is that? Is it a, a right triangle or something? Nope. That's a right triangle has a 90 degree angle. Oh. This one is what? No, nope, this is isosceles. Equilateral. What? Equilateral. 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 All three sides, and hence all three angles, are the exact same. Isosceles. Two sides are the equal length, hence two angles are also the same, and one third one can be, is different. The bottom one is called what? Obtuse is a type of angle. It's an angle that's greater than 90 degrees. See, it's that one. 
Uh, see, listen, I, it's, it's been a long time since I was in school, all right? Longer than you, all right? So come on. Put the brains. No, no, no. It's a scaling triangle. Scaling triangle is the most important shape in bonsai. None of the three sides are of the equal length, hence none of the angles are the same either. The most important shape in bonsai is the scaling triangle. Why is it the most important shape? Well, we want our trees to fit in there. Does that mean our trees are triangular shape? No. It just means that they kind of, gra you know, to some degree fit into that shape. Now, why is scaling triangle not isosceles or equilateral? Well, these are kind of monolithic. Not very interesting. But a scaling triangle, since it's kind of off balance, but we can balance it by the trunk placement and stuff, it has tension. And that tension creates movement. That tree looks alive. It looks like something's ready to happen to it. All right, so we take advantage of that fact. Very important design feature, not just in bonsai, but in any type of design. Scaling triangle gives you tension. This is very monolithic, it's just sitting there. Nothing's going to happen to it because it's just real well balanced and kind of boring like some people, you know. This guy's got action, all right? That tree's ready to do something, it's alive. Okay, not only do we want our trees to fit into that shape, but we want our branches to fit into that shape. We want our branches off branches to fit into that shape. It repeats itself all the way through the whole tree. It's like a fractal. It just keeps repeating itself, repeating itself, ad infinitum. All right? So we keep using that over and over and over again. You're loving this so much, I'm going to give you more. I wasn't going to, but let's just go one more step. Let's talk about the Fibonacci sequence. What? The, what? the Fibonacci sequence. F I B O N A C C I. Ratios. Huh? Ratios and the ratio. Kind of. Yeah, golden triangle, golden ratio, right? Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci sequence repeats is all found all throughout nature. Found in honeycombs, pine cones. It's found in the uh, Nautilus shell. All right, come on now. Did you guys, any of you guys read that Dan Brown book? What was the um, da the Da Vinci Code? Oh. Come on, nobody read the Da Vinci Code. No, all right, Fibonacci sequence is all through the Da Vinci Code. All right, one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four, fifty-five, uh, eighty-nine. That plus that equals that. 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 That that plus that equals that. That plus that equals that, and so on, forever and ever. The bigger you get, the more you create. You get closer to something called the golden ratio. And the golden rectangle is all formed in that and everything else. So it happens that if you start off with a cube of one and a cube of one, and then you go to a two, three. And then you go to a 5, and then you go to an 8, and then you go to a 13, all right? If you start connecting the corners, perfect Nautilus shell. If you take one of these this way, and you do another one the opposite way, pine cones. The way that the seed pods are arranged on pine cones. Honeycombs. The way that the little, those little hexagonal guys are in there. Fibonacci sequence. It's found everywhere. Most of the time it looks like total chaos or just something a little beautiful. But it does create a beautiful ratio that's found in all throughout nature. Everything beautiful has a Fibonacci sequence or a golden ratio involved with it some way. That's uh, engraved in gold plate on Echo, the one that's that satellite that right. Right. Going and going and going. Right. Cause it's, we, because scientists believe it's such a universal thing that if there's somebody out there to see it, they go, ooh, we know what that is. All right. Very, very important. 
Well, you're going to hear a lot of people, if you stay with bonds, I keep working with it, saying, ah, you got a tree. The first branch, and they'll tell you that the first branch goes a third of the way up the tree, and the second branch goes another third of the way up the tree. All right? That's your first two branches. Eh, wrong. Even very experienced bonsai people, bonsai masters will tell you this, and it's wrong. Your first branch, if you have a tree that is 21 inches tall, your first branch should be 13 inches high, which leaves you with, well, wait, let me get up to 13 inches. That should be a little more than half, shouldn't it? No, I'm sorry. You should be eight inches up, eight inches up. All right, so excuse me, eight inches up. So eight, and leaves you with 13. Your next branch should be five, which leaves you with eight. Your next one should be three, which leaves you with five. Now notice what happens. Your next one should be three, which leaves you with two. And then two, which leads you with one. What happens to our, to our branching? It's getting a little bit closer together all the way up the tree. It's gonna be a little bit fuller up here. We're gonna have our crown, all right? And we're gonna have per per perfect branching all the way up that tree. Can you, do you have to sit there with the, with, the, with the slide rule and drafting paper and everything? No, but keep this in the back of your head. All right, if you had a tree 21 inches tall, you want to be 8 and these 13. But if you had a tree that was 15 inches tall? Uses the same thing. All right, 15 inches tall. Let's take about a third of that. That's why you can use about a third. All right, so we got 15 inches tall. Go up about 5, maybe 6. All right, so you got 5, it leaves you with 10. Go up three. Three leaves you with seven. All right, go up two. Two leaves you with five. Go up three. Three leaves you with two, which leaves you with one. Just can try and take about a third of a third all the ways. So basically, so you don't have to use the exact Fibonacci sequence. What you want to do is not have a third of the way and then a third of the way. Uh, equal thirds of the tree. You don't want a third and a third. That's not what you want. You want to be a third of the way up the tree and then from there to there you want to go about a third of the way up the tree. And then from there to there you want to go about the third of the way up the tree. And you want to keep doing that all the way up the tree. You want to keep moving the next branch up about a third of what's left. Okay? About a third of the way of what's left. And you always have great trees. Do that, do taper, you can't screw the tree up, it's impossible. All right, questions? No more math, no more geometry, no more algebra. Yeah,